Get ready, get ready for this pipe and hot tea. Get ready, get ready for a tea time and filter with your girl love and tea. Spilling all this hot tea on this podcast street. So get ready, get ready for this pipe and hot tea. From tea time and filter with your girl love and tea. Hey, tea sippers, and welcome to another episode of Tea Time Unfiltered with your girl, Lovely Tea. And I got my girl, Lady J, in the house with me today. And we're here. We're going to talk about a few different topics. There's a lot of stuff going on. And I know a few people had asked me to speak on the whole Hung Shui situation. Um, and I've done some research, but I figured Lady J would be the perfect person to come onto this podcast just because she's had a lot of experiences with China and Chinese people. So Lady J, go ahead and say hey to the audience. Hey, everybody. Good day to you all. Thanks for tuning in. All right. So for people who do not know who Peng Shui is, basically, she is a very famous Chinese tennis star. She's on the same level as think about Serena Williams, Venus Williams, Naomi Osaka. Um, And what happened is that it's been about almost a month, right? Like, I think the 12th will make it a month. She Mm -hmm. came out of nowhere and went on to Weibo. And Weibo is like the Facebook Chinese version, right? Basically. she basically called out one of the top guys in the Chinese government. And this guy had been basically sexually assaulting her, sleeping with her for the past 10 years. And she legit couldn't take it anymore. And she blasted him on social media. And since then, she's just disappeared. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go ahead and kind of take over and explain what all was said on Weibo And um, if you could just kind of explain the letter deeper, because the mainstream media in America, they're not really explaining what all she said. Oh, definitely. Well, I have to say, when I first heard about the story, like most of us a month ago, I was like, oh, wow, Um, another high profile, you know, situation of a sexual assault. Um, However, living in Asia, I knew that it probably went much deeper. Um, And of course, doing my little bit of homework on the story, I see that the way it's being reported in the Western media is not exactly what the story is. And so what someone decided to do was kindly enough translate her uh, uh, Peng uh, Shui uh, Weibo post. Um, And the whole situation basically talks about the former vice premier, Zhang Gaoli. And basically how he basically groomed her, if if that's the word we're going to use, because mm-hmm. that is, in essence, what I feel has happened. And now, who is the man? Like, what is his title? What does he do in China? So he used to be um, in what is translated to uh, PSC, which is the Politburo Standing Committee. And. Um, he was kind of like an under lieutenant to a guy named Lee uh, Kai Shuang. And this man is in the current standing committee. So this man has like a supreme level of authority and power. Now, right. he is no longer in that position. He was in that position. Um, I think he left that in 2018. So he would have been in that role for about five or so years. Um And so he was in that position at that time. But before that, he was, I think, like a what you would call like a mayor. I could be incorrect. Um, But no, no, I think he was like a party secretary in Shenzhen. Um, And down there in the South, there's just money. There's just money. Um, And he, the connections that this man has, of course, they're going to make the situation go silent. I think this there's probably it's another case of a deeper situation here than most of us so realize. Kind of like her blasting like a government official in the U.S. Absolutely. Absolutely. The okay. Absolutely. So now what was said in that Weibo post? So in essence, what she said, and again, this is a translated version. So there's a lot loss. Um, but in short, what I gather 
Um, and I was able to pull this off of Reddit. So anyone can go on Reddit to confirm what I'm saying. But in essence, what it looks like she is saying is that he groomed her 10 years prior. Now, if that math is correct, that means that would have been 2011. Now, if anybody likes tennis like I do, you knew that she won the French Open in 2011. She came in high up in the rounds in the Wimbledon the same year. That's really when she was getting her chops, when she really, really bust on the scene. So in the letter, it looks like she confirmed that he ran up on her in her mid-20s, okay? So if you got this current vice premier at the time, because this would have been 2013, he would have been in there, I think. That would have been right around the same time, give or take. And he left and did his role. He's in a high stature, someone running up on you. You in Beijing, you know what that means. Shut up and sit, eat your food and sit in your place. And that is what it looks like she is saying. She was stuck between a rock and a hard place, and I feel bad for her. But not only that, the wife knew. Okay, so what was she saying about the wife? Well, in one part of the, the translated version of this um, segment, she says, um, she said, it's true that you were attracted to me first, quote. Otherwise, I could have been able to come into contact with you. That afternoon, I didn't agree, and I kept crying. I had dinner with you and Auntie Kong Jie together. You said the universe is very big. And she goes on with this poetic language, but what she was saying is that this man invited her a few years ago to his house to have dinner with his wife. Now, to me, as a person that understands on the outside Chinese culture, this girl is basically what they will call a Shao San, Shao San, third woman. Mm, so they were trying okay. to basically groom her into being his concubine. His, yes, his side chick. And in the letter, she goes on to talk about how he at first was just very, I'm going to take care of you. And I wish back, he talks about back in the day when he first met her, that he was like, I wish we could have met in another life when you were 21 or 18. Uh and then talks about how, you know, at first he's treating her all kind and nice. And then he begins to belittle her and shame her in front of his wife. And it's just very toxic and narcissistic and just absolutely crazy. And she was groomed and tossed aside, made to be fearful. And then he'd come back around and lurk. That is scary. Mm. And she got tired, it looks like. But the way that the media is reporting it, it's like, oh, she had a three affair with him three years ago. Um, absolutely not. No, this goes back further. And the fact that the IOC is using silent diplomacy to suggest that they're supporting her way war posts and her Me Too moment, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's it's a no for me. It's a no. Yeah, there's definitely something suspicious. I want to go ahead and, and play what Palkisha Malvani had to say on Weon about the situation. Yeah. Because if you guys don't know, after she disappeared, once the world started speaking up about pain, um, people like Serena Williams, Naomi Osaka, and many in the tennis community, they had to think fast. So mm -hmm. they sent out this email and they're, well, they're claiming that she sent the email to the government, but you can tell somebody typed the email. So it's really it suspicious. Is. So I'm gonna go ahead and play you guys the clip really quick here. Where is Peng Shuai? It's been 16 days now. Peng Shuai is one of China's biggest sporting stars. A former vice premier reportedly sexually assaulted her. More than two weeks back, she revealed her story. And since then, she's been missing. On the 2nd of November, she posted this. A complete account of the sexual assault, the horror that lasted 10 years, she said. China's former vice president, Premier Zhang Gaoli was named. Peng Shuai said he forced her to have sex and then forced her into a relationship. It was an intermittent and abusive affair that lasted almost a decade. 
Peng Shuai dared to go after one of China's most powerful men, and now she's being silenced by the Chinese state. For two weeks, we've been telling you about Peng Shuai, the allegations, China's censorship, the global response, and the solidarity from the tennis world. Leading names in world tennis have issued statements, names like Novak Djokovic, Naomi Osaka, and Martina Navratilova. They want justice for Peng Shuai. What is China's response? Well, first they feigned ignorance, as if nothing had happened, as if silencing Peng and her followers in China will do the trick. It did not. Global criticism against China grew. The hashtag, where is Peng Shuai, started trending the world over. So China tried to kill the story with this sham. This is supposed to be the latest statement from Peng Shuai. It's on your screen. It is complete and total denial. It says the allegations of sexual assault are not true. It says Peng is at home and everything is quote unquote fine. So what happened here? Is this really a denial from her or is Peng Shuai being held hostage? And I'll tell you why I asked that. Because of the dubious nature of the statement that has been released. First of all, the statement was not released by Peng Shuai herself. It came from a Chinese state mouthpiece. It's an exclusive from CGTN or China Global Television Network. They are the ones who put out the statement exactly like this. There is no letterhead, no PDF, no piece of paper, just a screenshot. And it gets more bizarre. Let's zoom into the statement. I want you to look at the third line of the text, there's a cursor there, the kind you'll see when you open Microsoft Word to write something. It's right next to the letter A, you can see it on the screen. And we aren't the only ones who spotted it. A lot of people on social media are talking about this cursor, like this man. Is this really a statement from Peng Shuai or did someone from the Communist Party just type this up and released it in Peng's name? I know what you're thinking. Why is this cursor such a big deal? Maybe someone was just sloppy. They did not care to remove the cursor before releasing that statement. It happens. It makes sense. But it doesn't make sense when you hear the rest of the story. When CGTN released the statement, they said it had come in an email. Let me read out what they said. Chinese tennis star Peng Shuai has sent an email to Steve Simon the WTA chairman and CEO, CGTN has learned. This is what they said. So they say this was an email sent by Peng Shuai to Steve Simon, the chairman and CEO of Women's Tennis Association. Are emails supposed to look like this? Even the recipient of the so-called email does not believe it. We have a response from Steve Simon himself. And this is what it says. The statement released by Chinese state media concerning Peng Shuai only raises my concerns as to her safety and whereabouts. I have a hard time believing that Peng Shuai actually wrote this email we received or believes what is being attributed to her. The WTA and the rest of the world need independent and verifiable proof that she is safe. I have repeatedly tried to reach her via numerous forms of communication to no avail. All right. So you guys just heard that. So this rabbit hole with this young woman goes very deep mm -hmm. and I feel really bad for her. I mean, the fact, you know, that she got enough strength and courage to even share her story because in Chinese culture, this is what you don't do, especially mm -hmm. as a woman, you're supposed to eat your sorrow and take your grievances to the grave. Literally. You know, from the time they're, they're children, they're taught this. So yeah. for her to want to speak out and share something that's been a burden, a burden on her for the past 10 years says a lot. And the fact that they snatched her up within 24 hours, mm -hmm. no one has seen or heard from this woman. And it's very scary because, you know, China has these concentration camps. They're having all these human rights violations with the Uyghurs. You know, it's a lot of nefarious things going on right now in China. And then to see this alleged email from her, but there's clearly a cursor there showing that the person was writing the email as <laughs> and they, screenshot, they were so stupid. They screenshotted it right after they wrote it and then sent it to the Chinese media. Mm hmm.
Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's, and, and this is the thing, though, and I have to be honest, again, um, having lived in Asia, I know that um, culturally the response of the Chinese, just like anybody, but it's a particular way, is very reactionary mm-hmm. um, and in haste. And it's sometimes not thought out. And I mean, as human beings, we all do that. But with the Chinese, it has a different type of flavor. Like if, if, and I know because we have media and things like that, that some of us are really visual. So if you, if you guys want to try to understand just the taste of the complexities of this story and how it relates to other stuff that's going on, go to Netflix and turn on any like Chinese, um, kind of series that actually kind of replicates this visual of imperial China where the women maintain a certain decorum and the concubines of the Shah Sons had their roles and their place and it was this toxicity and this 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 vexing you know fighting for placement between the women and to to own the place of this this high up man of this imperial individual and then the men had to play their role and anything outside of that placement of this saving face this allure of opulence and order under the heavens is definitely seen as an abomination and to be snuffed out that and so just do that go to netflix and just take a look at a series you can get a taste in the feel but then look at that in its modern context and then look at the 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 issues that we see geopolitically we have the olympics and the potential this oh we're gonna boycott <laughs> yeah <laughs> you we know can it's that. a lot um, of moving parts here it's a lot yeah, of moving because- parts really. That came out yesterday. If you guys don't yeah. know, um, you know, our favorite press secretary, honey, um, yeah, Jen Saki Saki, girl. Saki, she came out, Saki Saki, um, talking about they're gonna, they're doing a diplomatic boycott of the Beijing Winter Games. And to me, yeah. that's just a bullshit gesture. Okay. First of all, let's keep it real. It's the politicians and the diplomats that are allegedly doing this boycott. But what, were y'all even invited? Was was Joe Biden even invited? Were you invited, Jen? You know, it'd be more, I think we would take it more seriously if the athletes were actually boycotting the games, but they're not. And I don't blame them for not because, again, they've been training since they were like two years old to go to the Olympics. So I get mm-hmm. that part of it. But this is just a mere gesture. So a lot of people are calling out the United States like, OK, you guys are acting like you're doing this to stand with the Wagers and stand with human atrocities. But that's mm-hmm. really not why you're doing it. You know, it's just right. a hollow gesture because America is still going to be there. The American athletes are still going to be there. And even the Chinese government, I don't know who it was particularly, they even came out and they were basically like, yeah, we don't care. You don't run anything here. You're not going to stop the Olympic Games. We could care less if the diplomats from America don't want to come. Their athletes will still be here. Yeah. And who you are talking about, I believe, is the foreign minister Mm -hmm. um, of um, of China and would basically he's like he's always foreign ministry he's the spokesperson he's not the minister himself um his name is um Zhao Lijian and he's like what this is not a, a diplomatic uh question so I don't have time you know they will deflect and move that chess piece Jin Saki basically came out and I'm trying to find her quote just to make sure I'm I, you. I have it here. Let me go ahead and play the clip. I have it right here. Perfect. Of everything she said. U.S. diplomatic or official representation would treat these games as business as usual in the face of the PRC's egregious human rights abuses and atrocities in Xinjiang. And we simply can't do that. As the president has told President Xi, standing up for human rights is in the DNA of Americans. 
If human rights are in the DNA of every American, then why are only diplomats being withdrawn? Why not the athletes or the sponsors at least? Many US companies have partnered with the Beijing Winter Games like Airbnb, Coca-Cola, General Electric, Intel. All these companies are based in America. They follow the American law. So why are they still pumping money into China? No answers, neither from the White House nor from corporate America. I guess everything is fair in business, even genocide. Either way, China is pretending not to care. They say athletes are the heroes, not the politicians who clamor for boycott. Listen to this. The Winter Olympics held once every four years is a rare opportunity for athletes to show themselves. The protagonists of the Beijing Winter Olympics are athletes from various countries, not individual politicians. Those politicians who clamor for boycott for political self-interest are showing off and hyping things up. No one cares whether they come or not and it has no influence on Beijing's success in hosting the Winter Olympics. All right. So yeah, I just heard that snippet. You heard what the, the, the foreign minister had to say. Yeah, they don't care, Jen Psaki. They, they don't care. They don't. They don't <laughs> care. Because you know why? It's bigger than that. Like, let's let's keep it real. Like, we're sitting here and we're we're seeing, you know, Saki basically say, you know, we're not gonna make this move because of the atrocities in, in, in Xinjiang. And the reality is that is y'all go-to tagline, US um government. Yeah. I'm going to criticize my government because I can. But I'm going to say this. It's not just Xinjiang. Y'all are riding on Xinjiang. Xinjiang is the, 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 the worst of Xinjiang has possibly already happened. Fair enough. There are still things going on. Fair enough. But let's talk about the right now. The real reason I think there's so many multiple plays here. We we know the Taiwan issue. We know we these the destroyers that are going through the strait that's making um, PRC mad. This is People's Republic of China. We know that uh, they China sent back in March a full report on human rights violations to the United States. You know, maybe the U.S. government is upset about that letter and beginning with the quote, I can't breathe, George Floyd, you know, and then for six pages of that report, dragging the U.S. government responses to COVID since they wanted to talk about the, you know, virus, you know, and, and laying the blame on the government um, political standing bureau, the Chinese PRC, and not talking about your failings, U.S. government. So there's a lot of like a tick play. For that. Yeah, there's a lot they're, of back and forth. They're upset forward. because China responded back to them after they accused China of being guilty, which they are, of the mm -hmm. coronavirus mm -hmm. and spreading it and and putting out misinformation. You know, jailing doctors and all that sneaky shit that they did in 2019. Back. So when that global report came out, then China turned around and hit the U.S. You know what I'm saying? Back in their face, like, oh, you want to talk about us dropping the ball, but you guys need to clean up your own backyard because your people are a mess. Y'all's police officers are over here killing black men and, you know, y'all are riding every day in the streets. So they basically put together a scathing report about the U.S. and they titled it like she stated, I can't breathe after the whole George Floyd situation. So we're thinking this is why the U.S. diplomats or pulling out of the Beijing Olympics it has nothing to do with Peng Shang. It has to do with that letter that they sent, you know, that scathing letter from a few months oh, ago. Oh, definitely one of the bigger reasons. The report mm -hmm. on human rights violations in the United States 2020, this was penned by the Council of Information Office of the People's Republic of China in March of this year. This is one of the reasons. This is, but this is just one of the, the bigger issues that are going on with the other things, but they drug the hell <laughs> out of the U.S. government in this letter. And so along with the United States trying to show force, but oh, there's a part that I forgot. The Chinese weren't the only one to attach themselves to this letter. The Russian government did as well, <laughs> you know, so... You know, and then we know what's going on with that. We ain't going to go down that road just yet. But the situation with Ping, the IOC not really having this silent protest. You have people having to be forced to come out to support her. You have 
um, Jen Psaki basically saying, you know, the diplomatic uh, official response would treat the game as usual. Um, and a lot of people have been talking about boycotting the games, but don't nobody want to play with their money. Why? Because you have lobbyists for some of these same companies that uh, Palki Sharma from WION and the reports you mentioned or you know, played talking about, well, why is this so empty? You guys are going over here. You still got McDonald's. You still got that, 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 but you know, the money is still flowing in. Yes. Because those lobbyists have told congressional leaders here in the United States, y'all better not say nothing. Y'all can sit here and try to come up with an excuse, but y'all better not mess with our money. It's, it's just so much going on here. Ain't nobody yeah. stupid. You got to follow the money trail. That's what it yeah. all boils down to. It always goes back to the money. So, you know, people getting excited like, oh, America's boycotting the Olympics. Nah. It goes a lot deeper than that. We're not technically boycotting the Olympics. Mm -hmm. It's just that, you know, old man Joe is tired and he just don't mm -hmm. feel like going. <laughs> probably. <laughs> he needs a nap. At the end of the day, with all of that other stuff, yeah. it probably boils down to him not wanting to go. Basically. Right. He's tired. OK. He'd rather just stay and, you know, stay around his house and play golf. He ain't trying to go to China right now. You right. know, I mean, that that's really what you can boil it down to, because mm -hmm. this is just a hollow gesture. You Very know, at the end of the day, I really hope that at the end of the day, Peng Shui ends up, you know, coming out and they let her go. But this just shows you guys how fortunate we are here in America. And mm -hmm. so I'm going to use this to segue into our next topic. Now, you have this woman in China who came out to tell her truth that she's been burdened with that nobody knew about for 10 years. Well, now in America, we have the Playboy bunnies looking to, I, I don't know what they're looking to do. They're looking to stake their claim. Maybe they're looking to renew their fame. But if you guys do not know, Holly Madison, who was Hugh Hefner's main girlfriend, right, throughout the late 90s and 2000s, she is doing a new um, documentary series with A&E uh, to explore the dark side of the Playboy lifestyle. So she's on here talking, Bridget is on here talking, and many, you know, colleagues and things like that. They're basically now trying to blast the Playboy mansion and everything she allegedly went through. So I'm going to go ahead and play you guys that clip really quick here. I got to a point not too far into my time there. I think I was only like six months in where I kind of broke under that pressure and being made to feel like I needed to look exactly like everybody else. My hair was really long naturally and I was just like, I'm gonna go chop my hair off so I can at least look a little different. I came back with short hair and he flipped out on me and he was screaming at me and said it made me look old, hard and cheap. I remember when she cut her hair, he was very unhappy about it. Yeah, his world. Hef would be pretty abrasive in the way he said things to Holly. She came down with red lipstick one time and he like flipped out and said he hated red lipstick on girl that they didn't need to take it off right away. Even though other people could wear red lipstick and it didn't seem to bother him. It was very frustrating to live with every day, all of the drama that was going on and the tensions. I could definitely see that she was getting depressed and sad and her demeanor was starting to change. I remember there were times probably within the first couple years I lived there when I felt like I was just in this cycle of gross things and I didn't know what to do. Secrets of Playboy premieres Monday, January 24th at nine. Only on All right. So you guys just saw that premiere advertisement. And a lot of things bother me with this situation, okay? And one of the things that bothers me is that when the whole Playboy thing was being introduced to my generation, right? So back in high school, they would always do these little, you know, random promos on MTV, you know, constantly pushing this lifestyle of Hugh Hefner and his three girlfriends. And to us, they just had like the perfect life. You know, they're with mm -hmm. this old man, but they're claiming they don't have to screw him. They're able to travel anywhere, eat wherever they want. They look gorgeous. They have a whole glam team. And let's not forget the youngest one, Kendra Wilkinson, was our age. She People, sure was. When Kendra got with Hugh, she was 17. I believe that they had probably been smashing since she was 16 because Kendra's mother was an attention whore and was willing to sell her daughter. I remember, out that. Of Twitter. Okay? I remember that. 
I remember right. That. Now, yeah. All that is coming out now. But what bothers me with this is that for years they perpetuated this lifestyle to our generation so much so that they had black girls and other people, you know what I'm saying? Looking at this like, wow, this is so glamorous. And I want to be a, a playboy playmate. I want to be a playboy bunny, not understanding the depth of it, not understanding the exportation, the sexuality, because we were kids, you know, we're teenagers. You're just seeing this on MTV. You're just seeing this glamorous lifestyle. So you're not knowing any better. Next time on The Girls Next Door. Ever since we posed for Playboy last year, we've been bombarded with opportunities. I have been eyeing the brand new Porsche Cayman. I'm getting my grill today. I'm a PIMP. <laughs> so for now, all of them to, to be coming out with all these hobo tours, because this is not her first tour. Mm -hmm. This is like the third time she spun this story, but now she's doing it with A&E. Um, Holly has spun this story, Bridget, and it kind of bothers me because one, Bridget and Holly were older than Kendra. So yeah, yeah, they were. Yeah. Bad. Why did y'all stay for seven years? Mm. I remember when they had their own show on E, because that was one of the most top rated shows. Yeah. Their arrogance was off the roof. You couldn't tell them shit. Anybody who had something to say was a hater. They're old. They're ugly. They're jealous. They're mad because I'm one of Hugh Hefner's girls. But now we're seeing that everything that glitters is not gold. Hey, tea sippers To listen to the rest of this podcast, please go to Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, Tuned In, or AnchorFM.com, which is a free podcasting site. Thank you guys so much for the support, and stay tuned for the next video.